You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Yeah, you don't have to follow me, because, yeah, only you can set you free. I can give you an example, but eh, I can't do it for you, neither can anyone else. So, the next time that you look at the government and you go, "Mm, why don't they fix this? Stop and realize who's in there. And if you're having a problem, fix it yourself. Yeah. Hey, guess what? Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocketeer here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10. Also on the RLM Spreaker Channel, the RLM TuneIn Radio Station, RLM Internet Radio Station, RLM All Over the Place Station. (laughs) And you know what? That's how I am dealing with all of this madness. I deal with what's in front of me and I laugh at the rest of it. Because you know what? It's kind of like that that critter on Star Trek. And I know I've talked about this before. Old original Star Trek shows were that critter that fed off of negativity. When you focus all your energy on all that negativity, you're feeding that beast. Stop feeding it. Start laughing at it. Start doing your own thing. So long as you do not cause harm to another sentient being, hey, it's all good. Just behave by natural law. That's what counts natural law because man-made law is just that it's just man-made um that's right i do it all night long it it'll be (laughs) (laughs) oh goodness Hey, looky there, Slim Jim Flim is back in the chit-chat. Haven't seen him for a while. In any case, better get to all of my hi there's real quick. Because then I also have something else that I want to read to you guys just because I saw the words to it earlier today and it's like, oh damn, yeah, got to do that one. Got to do that one. Let me see what's going on over here on Twitter. Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. I really do appreciate. Also, hey there, BB9. And thank you to my other two followers that Dick started stalking, following today. I'm now 491. I'm nine away from 500. You know what that means, don't you? I'm nine away from having a five with two zeros behind it. <laughs> so it's a five. But it's got zeros behind it, so therefore it's a bigger number. If it had zeros in front of it, it really wouldn't be. But, hey, you know, you put that nothing behind it, and it's worth a lot now. Um, Yeah, I don't speak it, Rob Works. Oh, pancakes is back. Pancakes! Pancakes. Pancakes for supper are awesome. Pancakes and and, and uh, fried eggs and maybe some sausage or some bacon or some i don't know oh how fun bears are playing slide uh a distracted can you say distracted i think you can because that's what i am um <laughs> okay moving along thank you once again barman just tweeted me out again to let everybody know that yeah i'm live on spreaker right now and by the way if you're listening on spreaker it's awesome if you leave comments over there but i won't see them till i'm done broadcasting so if you really want to talk with me or have me respond back to you come on over to real liberty media dot com think of a nickname join the chat give me some static i'll give it back probably the rest of the chatters will join in on the banter it's all good it's all good Because it's all just cybernetic anyway. I mean, yeah, you can play with numbers on the cybernetic airwaves, but... eh, eh, What? 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 Yeah, I'm almost 500 years old. (laughs) Okay, maybe it's been 500 years since I last reincarnated. I don't know. I don't know. In any case... Where am I at? Oh, CNET. This is a bizarre tale of the Flat Earth Convention that fell apart. Oh, how fun. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, moving along. I may have to actually click on that. 
<laughs> oh, a viscous fallout and death threats and arson attempt. Holy crap, Anoli. Man, peeps, you know what? It's a belief system. You know, it's no, no reason to get in such a tizzy, y'all. Okay. And Broward refuses court order deadline. Oh, well, Broward County, you are a shining example of just exactly how much corruption is going on. You're just doing it out in the open. Okay, moving along. Where is I at? Yeah, over here on this realliberty.org. Thank you, Grimner, for letting everybody know that I am live right now. I also see Bobby Bain is over here, as well as Rob Wikes and Cyclo and Java, 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 Java Doctor and Bob Renner. And let's see, Mental Pancakes was here a little bit ago, but now he's, now he's over in the chitty chat. And I'm going to see if I can get my Freedoms Network to come up again. Because it wouldn't the other day. And it's like, what the hell? What the hell? Just bring it. Bring it. Oh, and while I'm waiting on that to, to pop up, I'll come over and look at Mines. Hi, Mines. Not convinced, Smith. Okay, Smith. I'm happy that you're not convinced. Um, oh, the Thought Police. Looks like you've had just a little bit too much to think here. I hate when that happens. Damn it. I'll just go ahead and share that meme over here on uh, in the chit chat. Yeah, cuz y'all y'all just quit having too much to think, okay? Cuz it makes their head hurt. Uh Oh, Rob Works believes. I believe. Yeah, there is frost on the pumpkin out there, pancakes. Lots of frost on the pumpkin, which is not necessarily cool. Okay, I'm just going to tweet that one out, too, because I like that. I like that meme. That's a cool meme. Okay, and it's not connecting again. God, dandruff, so much for me having the, the quickie links. <laughs> My cheater links where I could just go, hey, there you go, and then do the fun little emoticons instead of having to actually type while I'm trying to think and talk at the same time. <sighs> yeah. You can tell how well that's going, can't you? Okay, Minds is is full of minds, and they're having entirely too much to think. There's a MAGA over here. A MAGA? MAGA, MAGA, MAGA. You know if you put a T on the end of that? <laughs> okay, moving along. Uh, Crucible of Illumination. Oh, cool. You know, people have got some really cool names. Cranky Yars. Mm. Oh, Jim Costa. Dead. Is that his name? Costa? Whatever the hell. The the whiny poo that would not give up the... Oh, man. Talk about a butta bing butta boom. Um, sorry. Pictures. <laughs> huh. Moving along. Picky book. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> it's a freaker Friday. And my brain is gone. My brother just shared this. Uh, headline... Ocasio-Cortez can't afford to move to D.C. before her job in Congress starts. So um, she's known for many months that this expense is coming, and she hasn't planned for it. <laughs> well, she'll fit right in. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. She's also the one that said, I realize that it's going to cost so many trillion dollars over a 10-year time span to put everybody on Medicaid. But or Medicare, or whatever the hell it is. But, you know, they're just zeros. And, like, zeros are nothings. Which, th finally, somebody said something that I agreed with. Although, I did listen to a Mark Passio video earlier today, and he said something that was like, Dude, I've been saying that for years now. Seriously, I have. You know, that all forms of wrongdoing against another individual, actually, a.k.a. crimes against humanity, a.k.a. violations of natural law, are forms of theft. You can call it all kinds of different names, but they're all a form of theft. So, yeah. Stop stealing from each other. Stop stealing people's time. Stop stealing people's money, government. Stop stealing people's thoughts. Stop stealing people's lives or their liberty or any of that stuff. Just stop it. Be actually human for a change, or at least try to be. 
I know human is supposed to mean that it's like a monster, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, obstinately resistant to authority or control. Oh, that must be me. Refactor, refractory. Yay. Yay. I think that's me. <laughs> oh, and Rob, who's the crucible? Oh, okay. Hmm. Rob works fired up the bubbler. Wait a minute. Let me finish making sure I said hey to everybody. Uh, whoa. Oh, there's video. Oh, of somebody doing TD naughty things. Concerned citizens seeing ballots being transported in private vehicles and transferred to a rented truck on election night. Violates chain of custody requirements for paper ballots. Were the ballots destroyed and replaced by some fake ballots? Well, you know, we all know that there's... Here, I'll just share this video. So y'all can... Y'all can peruse it on your own. I'll put that over here as well. In the um, red pill. Just so. Just so. And... I befriended a duck. I have 28 ducks over in the red pill. Add that to my 66 over in the RLM, and I got lots of ducks. Quack, quack, waddle, waddle, quack, quack, waddle, waddle. Okay, I'm going to move right along. Um, okay. So, let's see. I've done Twitter. I need to stop looking at Twitter, because that's what gets me distracted. Okay, and I've done fakey book. Brother Choey is over here. Brother Fudd is over here. Uh, a few other people over here sharing all kind of fun stuff. Let's see. But I don't know that anybody's necessarily paying attention to me, which is fine. 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 So I guess that means it's time for me to get over and say hey. Say hey to all those fun and wacky people over here on the RLM Chitty Chat. Yeah, how about that, Congress? I keep seeing all kind of stuff from about Congress and, and and cheaters and voter fraud. You know, we've had voter fraud for, what, 20 years now? You'd think people would have, you know, before now gone, wow. So, like, does it really matter that I go and stand inside this little area and color in the circle? Uh, no, because they're just going to screw it up anyway. If it's not the results that they want, they're going to go in and doctor it anyway. So, there you go. Yeah, historical numbers. I'll bet they are historical. You know, just like um, that last, not not the trump Stilskin election, but the, the last Dangleberry selection, where it was actually, um, they had more people vote in some districts than there were people that lived in those districts. It was crazy. Crazy. Okay, so over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman. The most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. See? See how smoothly I moved into that? <laughs> I'm finally getting around to it. Round to it. Have you ever seen a round to it? I've seen square to it, but I've never seen round to it. <laughs> uh oh. Got a believer? <laughs> There you go, Rob. Eee, lock your doors and your windows. I see Grimner's over here as well. Not that necessarily that you need to lock your doors or your windows because Grimner's around. Because Grimner's an RLM god. And, you know, you don't have to fear him unless he wants to smite you. I also see the lovely Moose Girl is here. Hey, Moose. And you know what? Grimmy and Moose Girl are going to be on later on this evening for the Freakers Ball. So, yeah, you need to be sticking around for that. I won't be staying up for it because I got to wake early in the morning. And... Um, what would Hansel do? Is that what WWHD stands for? <laughs> Vinny, you're a goof. Um, I see the lovely Kate is here too, but yeah, stick around for the Freakers Ball later on this evening because I'll be sleeping through it, but I'll catch podcasts later. So, there you go. I also see the lovely Chloe. Hi, Chloe. Hey, we got a double dip in a Chloe going on here, as well as a double dip in a Chalcedony. It's just that one of them left the O out of it. So, mm historical mythical same same yeah well it's magic fuck you <laughs> 
I just love that. I also see Soikles. Hi, Soikles. How you doing, hon? Guess what, sweetheart? I am almost finished with the, the infinity scarf that I'm making for my eldest daughter. And then I'll start on the project for my youngest daughter. Yay! I'll have to take a picture when I get it done and send it to you. In any case, back to saying hey. <laughs> Distracted? Can you say? I think you can. D underscore C is also here as well as Echelon. Flash somebody who's going to be on tomorrow. Tomorrow at noon Eastern. I believe that's when that is. With the dork table. I will be woken. But Flasher will be on. And I'm sure it will be dorkular. Totally dorkular because he is like the Flash dork. So, there you go. I also see Gooberzilla is here, as well as yours truly. And looky there, what? Fluky is glaring at the duck until it dies of boredom. <laughs> Are you waiting for the duck to die of boredom or for you to die of boredom, Fluke? Don't go there. <laughs> okay, where was I at? Oh, yeah. I be Don C is in here as well as Meister Brower. And I also see a double dose of the pox going on in here again. We got poxified and poxophone. Pompa Pompa Pom Sauce is also logged into the chat as well as the lovely Wayne and RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Rob Woikes has been firing up that bubbler. Yay, Rob. Thank you very much. You'd think I have partaken of that bubbler since I am so distracted. <laughs> no, it's just been Friday all day. I also see Rome's is here. When in Rome's, do as the Romans do. Um, are we friends on Facebook? I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Skittle. Skittle apparently is no longer um, the F-Bominator bot. I don't know who the F-Bominator bot is anymore, but I haven't seen Skittles drop an F-bomb in a long time. Vinny's here! Vinny! I see you, Vinny. Um, oh, wow, that's a cool name there, Slim Jim Flim. Um, where am I at? Phantom! We have the Phantom of the chat is also logged in to the chat. Because... <laughs> I also see Asmo2 is here as well as Colfax101, Cyborg Noodle, and seeing as how it's a Postferian holy day, may you be touched by his cyborgian noodly goodness. Dakota! I hear it's nasty weather, but that neck of the woods, nasty weather. Um, Frumpy, well, at least in Nebraska it is. Frumpy's here as well as Gromit, and Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is also logged in. And looky there, JJ's! JJ's from Scotland is here. Hey, JJ's. Um, Kozu and Moy, 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 Moy are also here. And looky there, Pancakes has joined us again. Hi, Pancakes. How you doing? <laughs> I know. I got you, didn't I, Rob? <laughs> oh, Skittles got castrated. Oh, man, that hurts. Damn. Ouch. <laughs> okay, moving along. Uh, yeah, cakes. And then, to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Slim Jim Flim, who hasn't been here for a while, but welcome back, Slim Jims. Good to see you here. Now, over here in the red pill, let me go see who's here that is also, well, those that are in the red pill that are not also in the Aralumanumanumanum. I see Apostle is over here, as well as uh, F. Canella. And Juana Taco and Katie Troxel and QFTW and Soily. Soily. Soily's feeling soily. Ooh, that's kind of creepy. Dude, don't be doing that while I'm broadcasting. That's just wrong. Okay. So. Ooh, a key cat. A key cat. Oh, my goodness. Key cat. I, I know I'm distracted by Twitter again. <laughs> Oops. Damn it all. I hate when that happens. Okay, do I need to, is it on my page or did I put it on the brain food page? I never remember where I put things over here. Um, I shared lots of really fun videos 
earlier, but yeah, I must have put it on brain food. So let me go back and find the page because there is something here I want to, basically it's, if any of you have listened to the Wayseers Manifesto video, this is the whites to it. Now, I like that video anyway. The guy's kind of, I mean, he's kind of funky, kind of, kind of, there you go. Um, but I do like, I do like what he has to say. I'll just put it that way. And actually, I'll just go ahead and read it for you. Attention, all you rule breakers. You, oh, see, I already, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> It's a good thing I don't do video. That's just all there is to it. Take 3,497. <laughs> this is what you get with live radio. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> Y'all do this voluntarily. I can't cybernetically twist your arms. So there. In any case, <clears throat> back to... Attention, all you rule breakers, you misfits and troublemakers, all you free spirits and pioneers, all you visionaries and nonconformists. Everything that the establishment has told you is wrong with you is actually what's right with you. You see things that others don't. You're hardwired to change the world. Unlike 9 out of 10 people, your mind is irrepressible. And this threatens authorita. You were born to be a revolutionary. I would change that to evolutionary, but... Eh. You can't stand rules because in your heart you know there's a better way. You have strengths that are dangerous to the establishment and it wants them eliminated. So your whole life you've been told your strengths are weaknesses. Now I'm telling you otherwise. Your impulsivity is a gift. Impulses are your key to the miraculous. Your distractibility is an artifact of your inspired creativity. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Your mood swings reflect the natural pulse of life and they give you unstoppable energy when you're high and deep soulful insight when you're low. Have you been di diagnosed with a disorder? Well, that's society's latest way to deny its own illness by pointing the finger at you. Your addictive personality is just a symptom of your vast, underused capacity for heroic, creative expression and spiritual connection. Your utter lack of repression, your wide-eyed idealism, your unmitigated open mind. Didn't anyone ever tell you? These are the traits shared by the greatest pioneers and visionaries and innovators and revolutionaries, procrastinators and drama queens, activists on the social scene, and space cadets and mavericks and philosophers and derelicts, business suits flying fighter jets, and football stars and sex addicts, and celebrities with ADD and alcoholics who seek novelty, first responders, prophets and saints, mystics, and change agents. Because we're all the same, you know. We're all affected by the way. And we are all the same, you know, because we're all attracted to the flame. You know in your heart that there's a natural order to life, something more sovereign than any man-made rules or laws could ever express. This natural order is called the way. And the way is the eternal substrate of the cosmos. It guides the very current of time and space. The way is known by some as the will of God, divine providence, the Holy Spirit, the implicate order, the Tao, reverse entropy, life force, but for now, we'll simply call it the way. The way is reflected in you as the source of your inspiration, the source of your passions, your wisdom, your enthusiasm, your intuition, your spiritual fire, your love. 
The way takes the chaos out of the universe and breathes life into it by reflecting divine order. The way, when experienced by the mind, is genius. When perceived through the eyes, is beauty. When felt with the senses, is grace. When allowed into your heart, is love. Most people cannot sense the way directly. But then there are the wayseers, the keepers of the flame. Wayseers have an unexplainable knack for just knowing the way. They sense it in their very being. They can't tell you why or how they arrived at the right answer. They just know it in their core. They can't show their work, so don't ask. Their minds simply resonate with the way. And when the way is present, so are they. So while others are blind to it, and society begs you to ignore it, the way stirs inside you. Neurological repression blocks most people's awareness of the way. Censoring all thoughts and impulses from the unconscious is the prefrontal cortex, the Gestapo of the brain. Nothing with which violates its socialized programming even gets through. But your mind is different. Your mind has been cracked wide open to the way. By some miraculous genetic trait, some psychotropic chemical, or maybe even by the will of your very own soul, your brain's reward, gene or your brain's reward pathways have been hijacked. Dopamine employed to overflow the fascist dictatorship of your prefrontal cortex. Now your brain is free of repression. Your mind is free of censorship. Your awareness exposed to the turbulent seas of the unconscious. Through this open doorway, divine light shines into your consciousness, showing you the way. This is what makes you a wayseer. 90% of human civilization is populated with those whose brains are blocked to the way. Their brains are hardwired to enforce the social programming indoctrinated since birth. Unlike you, they cannot break out of this programming because they have not yet experienced the necessary revolution of mind. These programmed people take social institutions and rules very seriously. Society is full of games programmed to keep people's minds occupied so they will not revolt. These games often cause six fix ex sick fixations on peculiar protocols, power structures, taboos, and domination, which are all subtle forms of human bondage. This distinct form of madness is not only tolerated by the mass masses, but insisted upon. The programmed ones believe in rules so forcefully that they become willing to destroy anyone who violates them. Wayseers are the ones who call their bluff. Since wayseer minds are free to reject social programming, wayseers readily see social institutions for what they are. Imaginary games. Wayseers comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable, helping those who are lost in these games and refuse to help themselves is a calling of many wayseers. Since wayseers are the ones who keep contact with the original source of reality, they are able to disrupt societal conventions and even governments to realign humanity with the way. The wayseers are an ancient lineage, a kind of priesthood, carriers of the flame, ones in the know. There must always be wayseers to reform the dizzying, psychotic spinning gears of society. Giant, mindless hamster wheels obscuring the pure blue sky, keeping humanity shackled in a darkened cage. So wayseers are called to shed light on the madness of society, to continually resurrect the timeless transcendent spirit of truth. 
Wayseers reveal this divine truth by devoting themselves to the birth of some creative or disruptive act expressed through art or philosophy, innovations to shake up industry, revolutions for democracy, coups that topple hypocrisy, movements of solidarity, changes that leave a legacy, rebellions against policy spirit-infused technology, moments of clarity, things that challenge barbarity, watersheds of sincerity, and momentous drives for charity. Yep, we are all the same, because we're all affected by the way, and we are all attracted to the flame. So this is your calling, Wayseer. You found your tribe. Welcome home. I like that. He does it way better. <laughs> you know, he's got this rhythmic thing going when he does it. But yeah, he does it way better. Way better. But I just, I really like those words. I really do. And it's like, wow. Um... Yeah, and, um, you know, actually, f some of the things that I've been reading is that um, the original Christians were uh, practitioners of the way. They didn't call themselves Christians. So, yeah. Uh, ah, well, thank you, Vinny. What are you Vinny, yes, yes, Vinny, you are a way seer, my dear. You disturb <laughs> the comfortable. That is for damn sure. And yeah, and you do. You stir it up and you make people uncomfortable and you get them to actually see what the hell is in front of them. And that's what you're supposed to do. You know, wake people up to what's going on. Really. Never eat room. Oh. Never eat rooms and look in a mirror. What? <laughs> that's that's a good one, lady. Uh huh. Don't eat shrooms and look in a mirror. Yeah, but you got to remember where your focus is. That's what will grow. Uh huh. So if you're focusing on government corruption, guess what's going to grow? Guess what you're going to see more of? Mm hmm. If you're focusing on, um, you know, the wonderful things that people are doing for each other and with each other, then that's what will grow. You will see more of that. It really is. I'm it's it's odd, you know, and and I'm noticing it more and more. It's like a synchronistic kind of thing that the more I start checking out other things and I know it's algorithms and all that other fun shit. But then how do you have algorithms in the real world? That's what I want to know. Because, you know, search algorithms I can explain away with, oh, computerized algorithms and yada yada bullshit. But interacting with people and they bring up subjects that I was just researching on the day before. Stuff like that, it's like, whoa, this is just too freaking cool. Especially when it's total strangers. You know, someone just coming especially where I work you know now that I work at, at a motel and front desk and get to meet all kinds of new and unusual people and they come in and we start chitty chat and then all of a sudden they'll bring up a subject and I'll be like whoa yeah yeah or like the lady that had her Q anon t-shirt on and you know she started filling me in on QAnon stuff and then on the Mandela effect and then on and just on and on and on and I was like Oh, dude, I love this woman. And I have no idea what her real name is. <laughs> but I love it. It was so awesome. So, you know, the universe does respond to what you're putting out there. That's right. Um, wait, uh, no, it's uh, depends on if you're a heavy hitter, Grim. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. You should be programming the internet right now. Maybe you should, Slim Jim Flim. Maybe you should. Okay. 
Well, I just had to read that Royce here thing. And then I also, with listening to Mark Passio earlier today, um, it got me to thinking about the Founding Fathers and some of the quotes that he was mentioning and uh, some of the other things that he was bringing up. And it was like, wait a minute, wait a, wait a minute, I knew that. Hey, I said that. You know, so he got me thinking. So I did a little duck, duck, go search on um, the Founding Fathers. And then... I did something that was uncharacteristic for me, you know, and apparently, according to that article I read on Wednesday, uncharacteristic for a lot of people, I went to the second page of the DuckDuckGo search, and I found this really cool article that was from actually CBSNews.com. I know, unusual places that you find things. A wait seer and a wait watcher. Wait, huh? Hmm? Huh? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> um actually Grim, the link for that is um on the page. Just a minute, let me pull it up. It was it was something that I posted on Brain Food over here on here we go. We'll just do this. And let me see if I can. Uh, oh, well, fine. Be that way. Now let me do it that way. So, let me try it like this. Um, I will put it over on Twitter and then I will bring... Because it's, it's just something that I posted... Um, in brain food so what I can do let's see hmm dun 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 I don't know that much about this Graham I'll just do the the brain food link how's that sound hun <laughs> DuckDuckGoose.com I don't want to do DuckDuckGoose I get goosed in the ass um, Yeah, it's on brain food And you just got to scroll down Past a couple of things I did I did share that I hope it shared over on Let me look Let me look on Twitter I left Twitter open <laughs> I shouldn't have But I did Because I get so distracted Oh, Florida's voter vault has been found underground. <laughs> Imagine that. Okay, let me scroll and see if I can find if it posted over here. Or maybe I just need to go to me. <laughs> I don't I don't understand Twitter all that. I just use these things. I don't necessarily understand them. <laughs> there you go. Oh, hey, yeah. Here you go, Graham. Copy link to tweet. There we go. Thank you, Graham. See, you got the um, realliberty.org and I got the Twitter one. So, yay. Cool beans. Cool beans. Okay. <laughs> my impulsivity and my craziness. That's what, yeah. The lights are on, but that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's home. <laughs> okay. What? What? Oh, thank you, Grim. Because, yeah. Mm. Somebody's got to keep me in line. Damn it. Or at least trying to stand on line. Okay, this is from CBS This Morning. And it was originally posted, or actually it's by Michelle Miller and Vidya Singh. September 22nd of 2018. Ah. Um, now, um, Samuel Adams and Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were ones that I remember being mentioned on the Mark Passio video. But I seriously, I've never heard of this one. So, the title of it is, Why Isn't This Guy More Famous? The founding father you may never may have never heard of. Dr. Benjamin Rush is the founding father that people have not found yet. 
Author Stephen Fried thinks that it's high time America did. He had very quietly helped write the proclamation and set off the Boston Tea Party. He had written one of the first major abolition writings, and he was signing the Declaration of Independence at the age of 30. Fried spent five years writing his biography, Rush, Revolution, Madness, and Benjamin Rush, the visionary doctor who became a founding father. And Fried drew on a trove of previously unpublished letters and images, as well as Rush's own autobiography and diaries. This is Rush beginning to tell the story of how he met Thomas Paine, who was just a local writer, explained Fred, or Fried, Fred, um, <clears throat> as he reviewed one of Rush's diaries with Michelle uh, Miller. They talked about writing about independence, which Rush considered to be a very dangerous thing. He eventually decided that he would encourage Payne to write the pamphlet about independence that he had already started, and the pamphlet was called Common Sense. Now, Dr. Rush dined at City Tavern in Philadelphia with his more famous co-conspirators, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and even George Washington. However, the doctor was one of the few signers of the Declaration who rushed to the front lines in the Revolutionary War. I think that everything Rush did is so far not really well understood. But I think that the key to the American Revolution is that all of these people work together. People forget that when Jefferson was writing the Declaration of Independence, Rush was writing the Declaration of Independence for Pennsylvania, and each state was declaring its own independence. So this was a group effort. After independence was won, Rush reinforced his fight against slavery, and he wrote one of the first of the Founding Fathers' writings on slavery against slavery. He owned a slave for about 10 years after the war, he said, and we have really no idea why. There's been speculation that he bought a slave because some abolitionists bought slaves to free them. I couldn't find enough evidence that's, and that's why, that said why he had did that. Now, the abolition movement stopped during the war and it picked up again in the late 1780s. When it did, Rush freed his slave. Now, for all of his influence, Rush has not found celebrity the way some of the Founding Fathers have. Should Lynn manuel have written Hamilton about Rush, or should Lynn written Hamilton about Rush? Hmm. Well, that was Michelle Miller question. So, absolutely, <clears throat> was the response. Rush was a much better, more interesting person than Hamilton, according to Fried. I think Rush was a better person. I think if you ask Hamilton, he would have said Rush was a better person. Every person who comes to Rush says, why isn't this guy more famous? And what I found out in looking at not only his writings, but what happened after he died, is that there was a concerted effort to keep what uh, was most interesting about Rush from the public. Now, Fried said that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had written Rush some of the most personal letters they ever shared, making Rush the founding father who knew too much. Rush also had a contentious relationship with George Washington. Now, these uh, combination of things led the family to try to make sure the most interesting things that Rush wrote, that people didn't see them. And honestly, some of them weren't seen for over a hundred years. Now for Stephen Fried, resurrecting the most significant founding father we've never heard of is more relevant now than ever. There's a reason they use the phrase, more perfect union. No one thought it was perfect. And part of what I love about Russia's writings He's really trying to point out things about America that are going to be hard. Racial pre prejudice, having separate science and religion, or religion lives together, or lives together. 
having liberty and good government to live together. And so he wrote about these things in a way that I think is still thoughtful today and makes you realize that these issues are hardwired into the American experiment, which we are still in. And yes, it is an experiment, most definitely an experiment. And there are times when that experiment looks as though it has gone horribly wrong. And then there's times where I look around and I think, you know, it's really not going all that bad. Oh, thanks, Vinny. I just got goosed. <laughs> yeah, Freddy got fried. Um, ooh, the XL pipeline got... Wow, we have a pipeline coming through Kansas because there's some people where I work that their spouses are working on it. I'm not exactly sure where it's at, but okay. Mm I'm going to put this over here on realliberty.org as well. And now I'm going to have to do some research on on Dr. Benjamin Rush. Because, yeah, I'd never heard of him. Not that that's a real shocker. Because, you know, history was my strong suit with certain areas. Not necessarily with, you know, I was into more ancient American history as opposed to revolutionary history. So, I don't know why, but now I find it fascinating. So... more brain food make me dig some more you know people always say oh but once you go down that rabbit hole and you get to the bottom no I'm never going to be at the bottom of that rabbit hole because every time I find something that makes me want to dig more I don't think I'll ever find the end of the rabbit hole and I'm good with that so uh, da, 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 da. what's that I see a flasher Yes, it was a slow goose, Vinny, but that's because I was busy reading. Uh, Fried Freddy was driving his truck when all of a sudden comes along a duck. <laughs> he swerved to the left and he swerved to the right, but he just couldn't hit that fucked up duck. That's a good one, Rob. <laughs> That is just funny. Too funny. Vinny, you have a real serious problem with ducks, don't you? Okay, what is this? I was walking home late on a Saturday night and into Sunday morning in July of 2016. I was murdered, shot in the torso multiple times, and the police called it a botched robbery. But I still had my wallet, phone, credit cards, cash, watch, necklace. Who am I? Um, mm, hmm, wait a minute, don't tell me, don't tell me. Seth Rich. Ah. Okay. Hide ducks don't fly. Sure they do, Vinny. If you if you toss them like a football. Just saying. Okay, moving along. Now, that was one thing that I hadn't. You know, I'd never heard of of that founding for. I don't even remember. Supposedly he signed the Declaration of Independence, and wow. I'm going to have to look again. Hmm, but. Here is something else that I did not, well, I possibly knew, but yeah, wow. Somebody else had a oopsie. It's from zerohedge.com. Math error put, um, or a major math error puts widely cited global warming study on ice. Huh. Well, Apparently, a, wi a widely circulated study which concluded that global warming is far worse than previously thought has been called into question by a math error. That's according to the Daily Caller's Michael Bastash. Now, the Princeton, Sci Princeton scientist, Lori 
Resplandi and researchers at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography concluded in October that the Earth's oceans have retained 60% more heat than previously thought over the last 25 years, suggesting global warming was much worse than previously believed. Now, the report was covered or referenced by mainstream media outlets worldwide, including the Washington Post, New York Times, BBC, Reuters, and others. I've never read and others. I may have to seek them out. Now, the Washington Post, for example, reported that the higher than expected amount of heat in the oceans means more heat is being retained within Earth's climate system each year. Ah, oh, gee, I wonder if maybe those chemtrails have anything to do with that. So rather than escaping into space, yeah, because, you know, chemtrails, they kind of seal things in, don't they? In essence, more heat in the ocean signals that global warming is more advanced than scientists thought. And the New York Times at least hedged their reporting, claiming that the estimates, if proven accurate, could be another indication that global warming of the past few decades has exceeded conservative estimates and has been more closely in line with scientists' worst-case scenario. Since when have any of the climate alarmists had conservative estimates? That's what I'd like to know. Unfortunately for the Princeton Scripps team, it appear, appears that their report has been proven inaccurate. That's a nice way of putting it. Independent scientist Nick Lewis found the study had apparently serious but surely inadvertent errors in the underlying calculations. Lewis's findings were quickly corroborated by another researcher. So just a few hours of analysis and calculations based only on published information was sufficient to uncover apparently serious errors in the underlying calculations. That's what Lewis wrote in a blog post published on climate scientist Judith Curry's Climate Etc. website. So after correcting the math error, Lewis found that the paper's rate of oceanic warming is about average compared to the other estimates they showed and below average for the 1993 to 2016. Lewis's conclusion was replicated and supported by University of Colorado professor Roger Pike, Jr., who tweeted his work. And uh, Lewis found the study's authors, led by Princeton University scientist Lori Rasplan Rasplandi, erred in calculating the linear trend of estimated ocean warming between 1991 and 2016. Lewis has also criticized climate model predictions, which generally overpredict warming. Resplandi and her colleagues estimated ocean heat by measuring the volume of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the atmosphere. The results? The ocean took up 60% more heat than previously thought. The study only sent alarm bells ringing, especially in the wake of the United Nations' latest climate assessment. Now, the claim of a simple but profoundly important error is a big deal. So I've downloaded the data from Nature and replicated Nick Lewis's claims. And guess what? Lewis is correct that the linear trends reported by Resplandi et al. are not matched by or not matched by what the data indicate. Apparently, he's got a figure below, which uh, he just created based on the data provided by Resplandi et al. And, you know, mistakes happen in science. That's no crime. What matters more is what you do next. And in the graph, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um... Now, Resplandi has yet to respond to Lewis regarding the errors her... Um, he found, or or she found, in her math, uh, writing on Tuesday, To date, I have had no substantive response from her, despite subsequently sending a further email containing the key analysis sections from a draft of this article. Hmm. So. Dun, dun, dun. 
apparently, uh, Resplendi nor co-author Ralph Keeling responded to the Daily Caller's request for comment either. And it has 356 comments on the bottom of this article. So, mm, we, um, we used Common Core to do the math. And how dare you call us out? I mean, it's the new math. Duh. What's the meaning of life? 42. I'm just catching up on the chat. Yeah, there you go. Slim. Okay. Slim said it. The meaning of life is 42. Uh, dun, dun. I need a sip. Um, what is it? The meaning of my life is comic relief. Huh. Or no, that's my purpose in life. There you go. Comic relief. If you can't laugh with me, go ahead and laugh at me. I'm good with it. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. There we go. Get that posted over here on realliberty.org. Now, let's see. I hit that one. I don't know that I want to do that one. Um, I think I'll go look in my pocket. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I have all kind of aromatherapy recipes that I put in my pocket. I knew I was putting all kinds of cool stuff in there. So, <clears throat> let's see. Java Doctor gave me an aromatherapy thing too. How about we check out, you know, seeing as how we're talking about global warming and all this other fun stuff, how about this one? This looks interesting. It's from November 6th of this year. From sciencealert.com. Scientists develop liquid fuel that can store the sun's energy for up to 18 years. Rot row. Let's hope it's not done with petroleum shit. No matter how abundant or renewable solar power ha has a thorn in its side, there's still no cheap and efficient long-term storage for the energy that it generates. Now, the solar industry has been snagged on this branch for a while. But in the past year alone, a series of four papers has ushered in an intriguing new solution. Scientists in Sweden have developed a specialized fluid called a solar thermal fuel that can store energy from the sun for well over a decade. Now, the solar thermal fuel is like a rechargeable battery, but instead of electricity, you put sunlight in and get heat out, triggered on demand. That's according to Jeffrey Gro uh, Grossman, who's an engineer that works with these materials at MIT. Now, the fluid is actually a molecule in liquid form that scientists from Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden have been working on improving for over a year. This molecule, molecule is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And when it's hit by sunlight, it does something unusual. The bonds between its atoms are rearranged, and it turns into an energized new version of itself called an isomer. Now, like prey caught in a trap, energy from the sun is thus captured between the isomer's strong chemical bonds, and it stays there even when the molecule cools down to room temperature. When the energy is needed, say at nighttime or during winter, the fluid is simply drawn through a catalyst that returns the molecule to its original form, releasing energy in the form of heat. Now the energy in this isomer can now be stored for up to 18 years, says one of the team, who is a nanomaterialist, material scientist, Kasper Mothpulsen from Chalmers University. And when we come to extract the energy and use it, we get a warmth increase, which is greater than we dared hope for. 
Now, a prototype of the energy system placed on the roof of the university building has put the new fluid to the test. And according to the researchers, the results have caught the attention of numerous investors. The renewable emissions-free energy device is made up of a concave reflector with a pipe in the center, which tracks the sun like a sort of satellite dish. Now the system works in a circular manner. Pumping through transparent tubes, the fluid is heated up by the sunlight, turning the molecule uh, norbornadine, norbornadine, okay, or norbornadine, into a heat-trapping isomer, quadracyclane. Why do you guys have to come up with these weird ass words? Because I do it all the time too. The fluid is then stored at room temperature with minimal energy loss. When the energy is needed, the fluid is filtered through the special catalyst that converts the molecules back to their original form, warming the liquid by 63 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow! Now the hope is that this warmth can be used for domestic heating systems, powering a building's water heater, dishwasher, clothes dryer, and much more, before heading back to the roof once again. And the researchers have put the fluid through this cycle more than 125 times, picking up heat and dropping it off without significant damage to the molecule. We've made many crucial advances re recently, and today we have an emissions-free energy system which works all year round. Now, after a series of rapid developments, the researchers claim that their fluid can now hold 250 watt-hours of energy per kilogram, which is double the energy capacity of Tesla's Powerwall batteries, according to NBC. Now, there's still plenty of room for improvement. With the right manipulations, the researchers think that they can get even more heat out of this system, at least 110 degrees Celsius or 230 degrees Fahrenheit. That much more is what they think, on top of what they're already getting. Wow. So, there's a lot left to do. We have just got the system to work. Now we need to ensure everything is optimally designed. That's according to Moth Poulsen. So if all goes as planned, he thinks the technology could be available for commercial use within 10 years. And the most recent study in the series has been published in Energy and Environmental Science. Way cool! Heat you up! That's just awesome. And in Sweden, they kind of need that. They're up, way up north. Oh, Slim Jim has left. Bye, Slim Jim. What the hell is that? Trying to make parents get a license to let children play together? Oh, fuck you. Good God. And you know what's really sad is that people will go along with that shit. And the, if you just tell them, fuck you, none your business, and move along, it no longer works. If enough people just say, up yours, none your business, good Lord Almighty. Thanks, Rob. Now I'm going to have to look at that one. Oh, my Lord. That's, that's, that's just... Beyond moronic. Beyond. Okay. Oh, shit. And then I clicked the wrong button. Come on, post. Thank you. So, from RopWorks posted this over in the ch chat. RLM chat, that is. From the trenches, worldreport.com. It is dated today. DC bureaucrats are trying to make parents get a license to let children play together. Um, 
So let's say you and some of your friends decide to gather your young children together a couple of days a week for a few hours of free play. Maybe you switch off who leads the gaggle of kids each week, allowing for some shared free time and flexibility. Sounds like a great arrangement for all, right? Yeah, your kids get to play freely with their friends and you get some occasional free babysitting. Well, according to government officials in D.C., the dynamic conundrum. Does conundrum start with a C? <laughs> How about d disastrous conundrum? Um, arrangements like this are a violation or violations of the law. They're cracking down on what they call an illegal child development facility operating without a license. Oh, good God. <sighs> Would someone just jiggle the handle and give it a good flush just once, please? Mm. Back in the 1970s, a group of parents got together to create an informal playgroup for toddlers in D.C. in a spare room of a local church. Now, over the last 40 years, groups of parents and their two-year-olds have enjoyed these three-hour playgroups, which children can attend up to three days a week. The playgroup is staffed by parents of the kids who attend, and they take turns watching the children. There is no paid staff. Now, according to a recent Washington Post article written by Karen Lips, giving lip service to somebody, She's of the network of enlightened women. Oh, good God, there you go right there. Some D.C. government officials now are trying to regulate the program, which they contend is an illegal child care facility. Man, single finger salute with both hands right here. And people are putting up with the... Ooh. The Office of State Superintendent of Education investigated the playgroup cooperative in early September and issued a statement saying the group is violating child care facility laws and must get a license to operate. Back off, Jack. None your business. The parents are rightfully outraged. Oh yeah, I'd be drop kicking someone through the goalpost of life is what I'd be doing arguing that this is an informal, parent-led play group that should not be regulated as a child care facility. Government officials argue that the play group doesn't qualify for an exemption as an informal group because the parents, over the years, have established some simple rules for participation, including stating that parents can't bring contagious children to the play group and asking for emergency contact information. Both common sense things... Not necessarily what one would consider a rule, just a, although these days, apparently, we need to have those kind of rules because common sense went out the window years ago. Now, as a homeschooling mom, I host groups of children at my house all the time, sometimes with their parents and sometimes without, and my friends reciprocate. I have the same rules as this DC play group. Don't bring sick kids to my house. Tell me if they have any food allergies or medical issues. Give me your phone number in case of emergency. Oh, and take off your shoes. My house, my rules. If they're doing this in a church, God's house, God's rules. Which basically reverts back to natural law. Kiss my ass. Back off, over-efficient, over-officious. Guberman asshat. That was another thing, too. Mark Passio actually used that word in that video. He, he called people asshats, and it was like, yes, I've been saying that one for years, too. I finally heard someone else that I listened to on YouTube use the same terminology I use. That's funnier than hell. I about jumped up. I almost lost my knitting. <laughs> oh, well, back to this article. This is a gross overreach by the state. And maybe it's the last straw. Maybe it'll get people to go, what the actual fuck? <clears throat> so could the government crack down on these types of playgroups, arguing that they are not informal because of basic expectations for health and safety? 
or are parents so incapable of voluntarily determining health and safety expectations that the government must do it for them? Well, over-officious asshats seem to think so. The state does not need to insert itself into all aspects of private life. Parents are competent enough to create voluntary associations with other parents that benefit their children and themselves. At least that's according to Lips, as she writes in her article. Okay, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I, I shouldn't have dissed you. Shouldn't have dissed you, honey, because you're calling them bullshit, so okay. Ironically, if the Office of the State Superintendent of Educraption has its way and is allowed to regulate this playgroup out of existence, it would be creating a disincentive for parents to self-regulate, as a playgroup with no safety rules would presumably be a stronger legal standing, or would presumably be on long, stronger legal standing. Uh, mm, duh. Ah, man, that makes my brain hurt. Now, if the parents in this DC playgroup were wary of the operations or procedures, they wouldn't join the cooperative. Parents are highly capable of making judgments regarding their children's well-being without government meddling. The DC Council is currently deliberating on what to do with this long-time parent cooperative, excuse me, and similar playgroups. And the fact that the council is involved at all should concern everyone. This is a private, parent-organized group that has operated just fine for over four decades without the council's help. Gubermint should leave parents alone and focus on more pressing responsibilities. Oh, but why do that? Because, gee, this this is a gimme on the, on the job uh, yeah, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. You need me. I said so. Therefore, uh, pay a fine. You need me. I said so. Therefore, pay a fine. It's pretty much the way that works. But apparently, Lips warns that this regulatory encroachment could be the district's first step toward broader Gooberman overreach in this area and the crowding out of voluntary associations. I'm thinking they need a good single finger salute from both hands and a boot up the butt. That's what they need. Now from nanny shares to babysitting co-ops to regularly scheduled times to play at public parks, the official or the office of the state superintendent of Educraption has no freaking business there, but their investigators could find new opportunities to crack down on voluntary ways that DC families approach playtime and child care for their children. It's none of the fucking business. In DC and elsewhere, Gooberman officials should stay clear of telling parents what to do and how to organize. We don't need a license to let our children play. But a bing, but a boom. Back off, Captain Assholios. Thank you, Rob. That was excellent. Did you put that over on realliberty.org, honey? Do I need to refresh my page and see? I will refresh my page and see. Wow, talk about Captain Assholios. Holy smokes. Uh... No, he didn't. Okay, so I will. Thank you, Rob. That that just, wow. Can you tell that just kind of sort of chaps my hide? Just a wee bit. It's like, who the flying duck do you think you are? Obviously, an overly officious asshat. Hmm... I'll just put that on here. Yeah. Job security for that dork. Not for long. Thank you, Rob. Once again, that was absolutely awesome. Let's see. Oh, 
Okay. I'm I'm finally getting caught up. Um And thank you, Grim, for letting me know that yes it does. Diabolical conundrum. Despicable conundrum. District of curmudgeons. <laughs> I'll think of something that, that just fits. I will. Honest and for true. Maybe. Okay. Back to my pocket I go. So. Um, no, I don't want that. Uh, and I did that. And I did that. No. Did I do that? No. Da -da. Here we go. We'll go with this one. Oh, and then I'll go. Okay. This is from sciencealert.com. And uh, it's from November 2nd of this year. I'm, I'm just, yeah. It's a freaker Friday, and I'm just kind of freakishly all over the place tonight. So, there's something different about the gut microbes of babies born at home. Mm. Infants born at home may have more diverse gut bacteria. That's a new study has found. And this difference could have an impact on the growing person's immunity and metabolism. So we ought to pay attention. When a baby enters the world for the first time, they are rapidly colonized by microbes, including trillions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that keenly take up residence in and on the body. Now, these invisible passengers are what make up the hu human microbiome, and those in the gut are thought to play a particularly important role in digestion and the immune system. But there's still a bunch that we don't know about the human microbiome, including how it is established and how it changes over time. Now, some researchers have suggested that an overly clean environment is er in early life, such as a sterile hospital, can adversely affect a child's development. So far, however, most studies have been confined to the hospital, and it's still unclear what role the birthing environment might actually play in the establishment of one's microbiome. So to figure this out, the new study followed 35 entrants, infants and their mothers for a month after birth. Now while 14 infants were born at home and 21 in the hospital, every single child was delivered vaginally and exclusively breastfed after birth. Those are two important ways for the mother to pass on her microbes. Now, in addition, none of the mothers were treated with antibiotics, and all of them had immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact with their babies, with breastfeeding shortly after birth. Throughout the month, the researchers periodically collected vaginal swab and feces samples from the mothers, along with poop samples from the babies as well. Now, compared to the babies born at home, the findings reveal that hospital-born infants had a lower diversity of gut flora, and this change persisted for the entire month. The reasons for the differences between infants born at home versus in hospital are not known, but we speculate that common hospital intervention, like early infant bathing and antibiotic eye prophylaxis, or environmental factors like the um, aseptic environment of the hospital, may be involved. That's according to the senior author Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello who is a researcher in the microbiota function at uh, Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Now, these results suggest that babies born in hospitals are immediately exposed to less microbes and therefore have less diverse microbiomes in the first month of life. But let's be clear. While antibiotics, formula feeding, cesarean sections, and now hospital births have all been found to change the makeup of an infant's microbiome, it's still not clear if these changes are dangerous or long-lasting until you figure in the vaccines that they, most places demand you get 
prior to taking that child out of the hospital. That would have a profound effect. Now, even though a diverse gut flora is thought to be healthiest, researchers are still torn over the microbiome effect effects that immuni of immunity and dis causes of disease. Studies have shown that if the microbiome doesn't develop correctly, it can increase the risk of obesity, diabetes, asthma, and gut inflammatory disorders later on in life. But what does it mean to develop correctly? And does a lower diversity of flora in the gut mean that there will be health repercussions later in life? Well, more research is clearly needed. But the new study suggests that revamping the hospital environment so that it resembles home conditions may be beneficial. This study has also been published in scientific reports. So, there, oh wow, there's a link underneath here. Taking antibiotics during pregnancy is linked to increased risk of child infection and hospitalization. So stay away from antibiotics. They're bad juju. And if you've, I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but um, there has been a, a vast increase in uh, cesarean sex sections over the last like 40, 50 years. And um, children's health, I think, has suffered from it. So... Society in general's health, I think, has suffered from that. Um, because while the child is coming through the birth canal, they are also receiving all kinds of immune booster stimulation coming through the birth canal. And if they are cesarean, they don't get that. So... Oh, this is going to be one of those that's going to be a poopy head. So, natural childbirth. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I know. You're trying to retrieve the link, and you just plain can't retrieve it over here on realliberty.org. So, there. Told you. You're going to do it anyway. Um... Yeah, see now, Moosey, in situations like that, I understand that. And and with my oldest grandchild, she was cesarean because she was breech. And um, then once once my daughter had cesarean, the hospital would not even let her attempt to do natural childbirth. So none of my none of my grandkids were natural childbirth, which yeah. Um. I understand that, hon. And there there are times, you know, especially with twins. Those are circumstances where, yeah. But man, oh man, I know an awful lot of people that I honestly do know quite a few people. Um, that, um, you know, their doctor said, well, you know, if you want to schedule the birth or pick a birth date we can go ahead and schedule a c-section for you and it's like seriously what the hell i i do know quite a few people that uh oh i'm getting a c-section done on such and such a day and uh, you know that way it won't interfere with whatever plans i have and it's like oh good god oh good god that, that to me was absolutely insane. Dang, Van Meter. All three over 10 pounds? Yikes. Ouch, woman. Ouch. That's like having a bowling ball for you gentlemen. You know, just in case you want to try and visualize that. Ow. <laughs> Oy. My biggest was eight and a half pounds, and oh my God. Yeah, that was enough for me. <sighs> Especially when both hips popped out of place. At 
the same time. It's like, no, 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 no. We ain't going back for more. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to pull up this article, but first I'm going to go check out the pig because it is getting to be that time. Wow, time flies when you're having fun. So, um, see what happened this date in history. Um, ouch, 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 Van Meter. Oh my goodness, that, that just pains me to think about it. Ouch, girlfriend. You tougher than me. You win. Of course, my sister-in-law kicked my ass, too, because, you know, her first one was nine pounds and broke her pelvic bone. And spread it an inch. It's like, ah, some bitch. Okay, over here on, yeah, all you guys are going, oh, stop it. Um, over here on the pig, pigazette.com, word of the day is depends. It's a slam dunk as the next hot fashion fad at American Ivory Towers, where inmate infantilization has reached epidemic proportions. Well, you know, Last time I saw TV that had commercials <laughs> and I saw something about Depends undergarments, they now come in fashion colors and I went, oh good God, something that used to be something that people would go, oh my God, no, Ooh, send someone else to go purchase or whatever the hell. Now they come in fashion colors. Wow. Instead of fixing the problem, you give them fashion colors. Good job. In the quotable quotes section, statement of the century from Billy Connolly. If women are so bloody perfect at multitasking, how come they can't have a headache and sex at the same time? <laughs> Maybe because you're the one giving them a headache. <laughs> Do you ever think about that one, Billy Connolly? Smart ass. I like Billy Connolly, but yeah, smart ass. Okay, this date in history, the 9th of November, 1799. Vertically challenged dude with a chip on his shoulder, Napoleon becomes dictator of France, hatches plans to become the biggest man in Europe. And yet, he's vertically challenged. Although, what a lot of people don't realize is he was five foot six, which is really not that short. So putting that out there. Also, this date in history, the 9th of November, 1965, fumbling around with willing strangers in the dark becomes the order of the day when the great blackout shuts down power in New England, Ontario, and New York. Yeah. And finally, this date in history, the 9th of November, 2016, tolerant lefties congratulate Trump by rioting in the streets. Holy hissy fits, Batman. Yeah, I know. It was kind of scary. And the hissy fits haven't stopped. Oh, well. Y'all can come on over to PIGazette.com to say hey to Hambo and Porkus. Tell them Grammy sent you. Watch them quiver. They become jello really quick. It's funny. It's funny to watch. Um, What's that? She comes in colors. Who's this? Ow, ow, ow. Ooh, that's, that's a lot of baby there, girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. 12 pounder. I think my mom's biggest one was a le little over 11 pounds. My mom's longest labor was an hour. So when she called me and I said, oh, mom, I've been in labor for like eight hours. She's going, why aren't you at the hospital? <laughs> yeah, first one was 25 hours. Second one was false labor for two months and then real labor for five and a half hours. So, and I still don't hold a candle to my sister-in-law who was in labor for three and a half days. Oh, God. 
Yeah. Okay, moving along. So, that was PI Gazette. Did I put that other one on? I did that. I did that. Did I do that? No, this is the one I wanted to get to. Okay. This is from offguardian.org. It was originally published on Halloween. I didn't see it on Halloween, or I may have done it on Halloween, but I didn't see it, so you get to have it now. I think it was in one of my recommendeds. Unpock it. So, Spooks and the Masked Media. Hmm. Back of, uh, back of the world in which we live, far in the background, lies another world. The relation between the two is not unlike the relation we sometimes see in the theater between the four-stage scene in the regular acting area and the scrim scene projected behind it. Through a thin haze we see, as it were, a world of gauze, lighter, more ethereal, qualitative, different from the actual world. Many people who appear bodily in the actual world do not belong in it, but in that other. That's from Soren Kierkegaard, or Diary of a Seducer. And from the outset, the use of journalists was among the CIA's most sensitive undertakings, with full knowledge restricted to the Director of Central Intelligence and a few of his chosen deputies. And finally, personal, personality is persona, a mask. The mask is magic. Larva means mask or ghost. It also means mad, a case of demonic, yeah, demonical possession. Hmm. So, there are innocent and guilty actors populating the American stage. Unlike the naive children who joyously revel in the costumes they don for Halloween, unaware as they are of the death fears they exercise, the corporate mainstream media wears their masks year-round. While they consciously abet the United States government, its intelligence agencies, and its allies in exercising their God-given right to inflict death on people around the world, including many innocent children. So to point out the media's sickening hypocrisy, the Greek hypocrites is stage actor is in one way quite easy and facile, but in another quite difficult because of the powerful hypnotic hold people's trusted media have on them. To even suggest that people's favorite mainstream media are doing the work of the secret state feels so insulting to people's intelligence with its suggestion of gullibility that many recoil in anger at the possibility. Now, a common retort is that it is absurd to suggest that the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox News, CNN, etc. are all just disseminating propaganda from behind a mask of objectivity. And is that small word just that reveals the falsity of the reply? For obviously, these media organizations report truthfully on certain matters. For if they didn't, their lies would not work. But when it comes to crucial matters of foreign or domestic policy, matters that involve the controlling interests of the elites, lies and deceptions are the rule. Yes, Trump is a narcissistic mana, uh, mana personality who has entranced and mystified his hardcore followers. But to think he's the only hypnotist on the stage is childish beyond belief. The psychoanalyst Sander Ferenzi observed that people are so susceptible to returning to an imaginary childhood through hypnotic trance because in our innermost soul we are still children and we remain so throughout life. So like the little children who go trick-or-treating dressed up as ghosts, witches, or grim reapers, adults too fear death and are easily induced to believe godlike authorities who will quell their fears and ostensibly 
explain to them who the bad good guys and bad guys really are. So like parents with children, the masked media magicians play the good cop bad cop game with great success. Obama was a god, Dangleberry. <laughs> Trump, the devil. No, Trump is an Oompa Loompa. Trump is a savior, Obama a destroyer. Wow, that's a toss up. Uh, this charade is so obvious that it's not. But that's how the play is played. At the moment, all eyes are on Trumples, who commands center stage. And those obsessively transfixed, uh, transfixed eyes are staring out of the heads of people of all political persuasions, those that love and those that loathe the man and all he stands for. And who has created this obsession? But none other than our friends in the corporate media, the same people who gave us Obama mania. So meanwhile, backstage, it's a wonderful life. There's Saudi Arabia and the recent news about the killing of Jamal uh, Khashoggi and the Saudi war on Yemen. You may rightly wonder what that is all about. And you might remember and be wondering about the poisoning alleged by Russia of those Russian nationals, Sergei and his daughter Yuli, who've been kept in total isolation by the British authorities for eight months. Do you wonder about where the war against Syria went? Has it just gone to sleep until after November selections? Is that what wars do? Take naps? Do you wonder obsessively about the upcoming midterm selection and all those former CIA folks running for office? Crucial selections, the media tells us. The state of the country is riding on them, right? Or is it the world? There is so much to wonder about. The costumes are so creative. The masks mesmerizing. Something's happening, right? There is so much to wonder about in Wonderland. Something is happening as Dylan sings. So you raise up your head and you ask, is this where it is? And somebody points to you and says, it's his. And you say, what's mine? And somebody else says, well, what is? And you say, oh my God, am I here all alone? But something is happening, and you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? So as you no doubt do know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the other corporate media are outraged by the killing of Khashoggi and now by the Saudis' war on Yemen. So does their outrage make you wonder how outrage works? From seven years ago, the extent of America's war in Yemen has been among the Obama administration's most closely guarded secrets, as officials worried that news of unilateral American operations could undermine Mr. Sal Saleh's tenuous grip on power. That was the New York Times' Mark Mazzetti on June the 8th, 2011, two and a half years into Dangleberry's administration. This is Mark for October 20th of 2018. Saudis, image makers, a troll army, and a Twitter insider. On a conversation viewed by the Times, dozens of leaders, Saudi, decided to mute critics of Saudi Arabia's military attacks on Yemen by reporting the messages as Twitter to Twitter as sensitive. Now the article goes on to describe how the formerly Saudi good guys are getting bad and doing Russian-like stuff like trolling and swarming and stifling critics on Twitter in a propaganda and public relations campaign. Boy, isn't it shocking and a cause for wonder? And what they wouldn't do? Hmm... 
And then there's the Times. The Emotional Story from October 20th, 2018 by Declan Welsh with photos and videos from Tyler Hicks. This is the front line of Saudi Arabia's invisible war. And it says the Khashoggi crisis has called attention to the largely overlooked Saudi-led war in Yemen. On a rare trip to the front line, we found Yemenis fighting and dying in a war that has gone nowhere. Largely overlooked? By whom? Gone nowhere? And where was it supposed to go? Now what's happening, Mr. Reader? Has the worm turned? Do you wonder? It's hard to remember to forget or forget to remember, isn't it? Now, would this article, you know, U.S. stepping up weapons shipments to aid Saudi Arabia or Saudi air campaign over Yemen from April of 2015 make you wonder what's happening now? It begins with... The United States appears to be uh, slowly but steadily deepening its involvement in the war in Yemen. So many things appear and disappear to make you wonder, doesn't it? Yes, the American stage is populated with so many spooky masked media characters. You'd think they were out to scare and trick us rather than treat us well. Well... I'm afraid that's what's happening in Wonderland, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Edward Curtin. I do like the way you write. And yeah, that is what's happening. Anything to keep you off of what they're doing. Ah, yes, Vinny, I did. Okay. Long live the weirdo. Yes, Vinny, and you are a weirdo, honey. Uh, dun, dun. Let me put this over here on realliberty.org as well. Holy smokes. Time is flying. Okay, so let me see what else I have in my pocket real quick. Um, which one do I want to go to? Mm, I think I will just go and check out the recommended over here on pocket because sometimes they have really really interesting things what is that ah from mark and angel dot com five notes to self about the precious little time you have left so I hope this is not really, really long. A good girl who didn't make it. Alyssa was my best friend. She was a talented musician, a graceful gymnast, a brilliant writer, and a deeply passionate human being. She cared about people. Love bled from every facet of her being. When she spoke, her eyes were as sincere as, sincere as her words. And she always wanted to understand what was wrong so she could strive to make it better. But Alyssa woke up one day during her senior year in college with a strange pain in her chest. On-campus doctors didn't understand why, so they referred her to a specialist. After several MRIs and blood tests, they determined that she had a rare, escalated case of Hodgkin's lymphoma, a form of cancer. She spent the next three years suffering through varying degrees of pain and sickness until multiple doctors treated her or as multiple doctors treated her with radiation and chemotherapy. And although these doctors were initially hopeful, 
Her condition worse, worsened, and she eventually succumbed to cancer on her 25th birthday. Wow. A bad guy who did. Ethan was also my friend. <clears throat> Although not as multi-talented as Alyssa, he was incredibly smart, particularly when it came to money and business tactics. But sadly, he didn't care about people one bit. I eventually learned, just before ending our 10-year friendship, that he ripped people off for a living. He primarily targeted elderly folks, who had a relatively small life savings. They're all suckers, he told me, and he felt no remorse because he continued... They'll all be dead soon anyway. Ethan, at the age of 37, is a multimillionaire. And although we haven't spoken in years, I've heard from others that he still hasn't gotten into any legal trouble. Largely, I think, because of the calculated legal threats I've heard he makes to anyone he suspects might have a good conscience. I hear also that he doesn't suffer from any major health problems and that he his complicit wife, and his two healthy sons live in a mansion somewhere in L.A. So, the reasons we make our time count. Hmm. These are real stories, and yet they're old stories, familiar stories. The people and circumstances differ slightly for everyone who tells them. But the core lesson remains the same. Life is short, and it isn't fair. Bad things do happen to good people, and good things do happen to bad people. Tragically, these stories and lessons often fuel the excuses many of us use when we choose not to follow our hearts. And they fuel the excuses many of us use when we choose to treat ourselves and each other without dignity and respect. Why care, we argue? When the Alyssas of the world suffer and die young while the Ethans of the world sip wine at five-star resorts well into their 80s. So, because uh, for some of us, Alyssa and Ethan are the reason we do follow our hearts, his story is the reason we live to make the world a little brighter, to make people a little happier. And her story is the reason we use all of the strength we have right now. Because we know we may not have the same strength tomorrow. Because a world with no guarantees requires us to make the best of the precious little time we have left. So, here are the five notes. I mean, there's little descriptors with it, but I'm running short of time. So, the five notes to yourself for making your time count. Number one, opportunity is only ever found in the present. Yeah. So if you have an opportunity, go for it. Especially if it's one that's going to make, you know, feel good and maybe even benefit others. Go for it. Number two, your entire life can be customized from day to day. In other words, Whatever happened yesterday, you can't redo it, you can't relive it, you can't make it go away, you can't make it better or make it not happen, so deal with it and move on. All you've got is today. And every day is a new day, so just go along with that. Number three, the willingness to do hard things makes life worth living. So, yeah. If you're in a relationship, sometimes those are hard work. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes jobs are hard to do. Sometimes they're not. But if they're still enjoyable, if everything makes you smile at the end of the day, hmm, it's worth it. Number four, daily kindness is a beautiful legacy to leave behind. Oh, what we do. Will it affect people 50 years from now, 25 years from now, one year from now? Do you really even need to worry about it? It is kind of nice, though, to have people go, yeah, she was always smiling. That's a, that's a pretty good legacy to leave. And number five, everything will change again, faster and sooner than expected. 
because nothing lasts forever, everything changes, and day to day is a winding journey. So, excellent advice. Um, be sure to stick around because later on this evening, Grimmy and Moose Girl will be on with uh, the Freakers Ball. Tomorrow at noon Eastern Time will be um, Flash a Rooney Dork with the Dork Table here on RealLibertyMedia.com. Also, Sunday at noon, Grimner is going to be kicking off the blues, and I hope there's going to be a rousing game of trivia going on in the chat. And um, I may actually get to be home to participate in some of this. That would be way cool. Also, directly following Grimner will be um, Hal Anthony, who's going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass behind the woodshed. So be sure to check that out as well. Um, Flash Rooney will be on, and who knows, he may have a special guest. He may not on Tuesday. I believe it's at noon Eastern Time. Flash is going to give me shit about this. Tuesday for In a Perfect World. Ah, In a Perfect World. You know, if the world was perfect... For one person, it may not be perfect for another. And that's okay. That's okay. Because you know what? If we, were, if we were all the same, what a dull world it would be. You would have no surprises. You would have no moments of infuriating, infuriating want to drop kick someone through the goalpost of life and then joy because someone else did it and you didn't have to bruise your foot. <laughs> yeah, life is about those little little moments, those little joys. <laughs> oh well, I will be back on Wednesday for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of the Rocket Chair. I thought maybe I was a little bit closer to the end of time than I am right now. So apparently, I have time to see if I can find one more thing to keep myself occupied and to entertain you with. Oh, what was that from Gilligan's Island? Let me entertain you. <laughs> Bless her heart. Poor little Marianne when she thought she was Ginger. Uh, that was, and then Ginger was not so pleased because Marianne made all of her dresses shorter. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I know. I'm showing my age with that reference, ain't I? I am a Grammy Mary, don't you know? Um, I believe you have, Vinny. I believe you have lived more lives than, than most cats. I would believe that. Okay, let me see. I haven't been to Oopy for a while. How about I go check out UPI.com. Where is my UPI? There it is. I knew I had a shortcut for it. See what kind of weird stuff look in their odd news. By the way, everybody, please keep the people out in uh, California in your prayers. Because, yeah, um, those fires are not cool. Excuse me, too. Belch. Wow. Okay, this is just, wow. I just barely have time. There's a video here. Teen solves three Ru Rubik's Cubes at once for a Guinness record. A Chinese teenager who already holds two Guinness World Records broke two more by solving Rubik's Cubes in unusual ways. Zimen, who's a resident of Qu... Yeah, he's in China, was observed by a Guinness... Ad 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 yeah, that person, by someone from Guinness. <laughs> When he solved three Rubik's Cubes at once, one in each hand and one with his feet in one minute, 36.39 seconds. Now, Q had, uh, then suspended himself from a bar and broke the record for the fastest time to solve a Rubik's Cube upside down, finishing with a time of 15.84 seconds. That's 1.6 seconds faster than the previous record, ho record holder. And Q previously broke Guinness World Records for fastest time to solve three Rubik's Cubes whilst juggling and fastest time to solve a Rubik's Cube by a team of two. For beginners, it may look uh, 
much difficult to achieve these records. At first, I solved the cubes by using the formulas. After millions times of practice, I was familiar with all the logic of the formulas, and then I upgraded them to my own way. That is what Q told the Guinness officials. I'm thinking I started on a Rubik's Cube when they first come out, and I have yet to solve it. <laughs> Mainly because I got pissed and threw it across the room. But, graphics! What's that? Uh-oh. Howdy, graphics. How you doing? In any case, thank you all for listening in on this Freaker Friday evening. I will catch you all on the flip side. Now that I've done that, I am running out of time. So, please remember... I truly do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Have an awesome weekend. Good night.